I really need to emphasize that China's economic growth has no precedent in human history. It's the most remarkable example of development in human history. In, in not just economic development, simply human development. The West only represents around 13% of the world population. So objectively speaking, China is not isolated. In fact, increasingly, it's Western countries that are isolated. Because it's easy to explain. They're waging wars, they're imposing unilateral sanctions, they're bullying countries, they're lecturing countries. That's why it's become very common to hear diplomats in the Global South say, when a Western politician visits, we get a lecture. When a Chinese diplomat visits, we get a bridge, we get a road, we get a hospital. So Western politicians will fly to an airport in a Global South country that was built by China. They will go on a road that was built by China. They will go into a big yeah. building that was built by China and then tell that official in Africa or Latin America or another part of Asia, they'll tell them, don't trust China. If you look at many regions around the world, the US is the one fostering instability, conflict, and even war, and China is encouraging peace. And again, it's simply because China understands that you cannot have economic development with instability and war. If you, if you are guided by capitalist interest, only trying to make profits, if big corporations control you, then okay, you will fuel these conflicts and then you can make a bunch of money profiting from the conflicts, like the US does, right? But if you look at it from China's perspective, which can actually have a government that acts in mutually beneficial ways, because it's not controlled simply by large corporations, it's controlled by the Communist Party of China acting in the interest of the people of China, they can say things like, all right, let's sit down and let's talk about how we can both benefit. I mean, that should be how humanity operates. What's up, everybody? Welcome to Talk It Out with me, Li Jingjing. This show always tries to show you the different voices and stories from China and the rest of the Global South. And today, I have a special guest who is an old friend of this show. He appeared on this show many times, and he's an online sensation. His show on YouTube, Geopolitical Economy Report, has 120,000 followers. I know his name is so popular that many people would love to meet him in person. He offers a very unique, very important views on geopolitics. His name is Ben Norton, and he recently moved to Beijing. So Ben, welcome to the show and welcome to Beijing. Thank you for that very generous, too generous introduction. It's a real pleasure being here. and. It, it was always great being on your show on Zoom, but it's much better in person. <laughs> and I have to ask you, a lot of people would be surprised that you are in Beijing. You are not just in Beijing for a few days. You actually moved to Beijing. You will stay here for at least one or two years. I mean, why? How come you make such a big decision? Last time I checked the Western media, like The Economist, China's economy is collapsing. And you moved to China? Well, I wanted to be here to see the collapse so I can report on it. No, I mean, obviously, that's ridiculous propaganda. We'll talk about that later. I mean, it's actually the opposite. One of the main reasons I came to China is I wanted to study the Chinese economy and the Chinese political model because it's, it's the opposite of collapsing. It's actually growing very rapidly, growing much better than any other economy in the world, including the Western economies, which are, in fact, many of which are declining and in recession right now. So it's psychological projection, as they say, accusing your adversary of what you're guilty of yourself. But why I came to China, I mean, it's clear I wanted to get my own perspective on the ground. You know, you can read a lot about countries, you can watch documentaries, you can talk to people from the country, but nothing replaces going to the country, seeing it with your own eyes. I spent a lot of time in Latin America, and I had, I had read a lot about Latin America, I had watched documentaries, but when I went and visited countries like, you know, Venezuela, Nicaragua, Bolivia, etc. You really understand it in a deeper way. And in China, I also, the plan is to do a PhD as well. I was planning on doing a PhD in economics or political economy. And I didn't want to do it in a US university. I didn't want to do it in a European university. So I was like, I should go to China. I mean, not only does it have this incredible history and this economic model that I want to study, but I mean, China is an international, Beijing is an international hub, and there are so many professors and journalists and students and people from around the world. So, I mean, I've been here for about a month, and I'm gonna be here for several years. It's just the beginning, I'm, I'm learning Chinese slowly. 
but it's already been an extremely rewarding, uh, very rewarding experience. I mean, it's such a surprise to me that you will be here in Beijing and we can do this interview in person. And from the beginning of this year, 2023, I've been meeting friends from every country, from all over the world, uh, coming to China, coming to Beijing. Everyone's coming to Beijing. I think this is a reflection of the trend in the world now. No matter how the Western media try to demonize China, try to talk down on China, still you see people are genuinely interested in knowing the country. So they come here to see themselves. They don't believe the Western mainstream media anymore, right? That's absolutely right. And, and I would add in particular, many people from the global south. There are not as many Westerners here as there used to be, at least that's what I've been told, but there are more and more people from other parts of Asia, from Africa, from Latin America. And it's very obvious. It's because they want to learn from China's incredible success, in particular economically. I mean, that's also why I'm here, again, to study the, that with Chinese economists, political economists to understand, because I really need to emphasize that China's economic growth has no precedent in human history. It's the most remarkable example of development in human history. In, in not just economic development, simply human development raising living standards. So not only have more than 800 million people be, been lifted out of poverty since the revolution in 1949, not only has absolute poverty, extreme poverty been eliminated, but furthermore, one clear example is life expectancy. Before the revolution, before the triumph of the revolution in 1949, the average life expectancy in China was 33 years. The average person would die at just 33. I mean, I would be basically dead. So. Th that's incredible. Whereas today, the life expectancy in China is 78, which is higher than the United States. And in the United States, life expectancy is, is declining over time, whereas in China, it continues to rise. So many people from developing countries are coming here and saying that we need to learn from what China is doing. And of course, they're not believing the Western propaganda because they can see that the West is in decline. Even if you look at the global economy, China's economy now is larger than the U.S. economy when you measure it at purchasing power parity, which is the real way to measure an economy because what a lot of economists do is they simply take the size of the economy and they measure everything in dollars, which is ridiculous because if you go out in the street, people aren't buying food and products with dollars, right? They're using their local currency. So when you actually measure what people can buy, the purchasing power in Yuan, here in China, the economy is larger than the U.S. economy when you measure it at purchasing power parity. The Chinese share of the global economy is increasing over time, whereas the U.S. share is decreasing. And furthermore, when you take China not only as an individual country, but as part of a larger global south bloc, and if you look at BRICS, for instance, BRICS now represents a larger share of the world economy than the G7 countries, the old colonial powers. And once again, it's the same trend. The BRICS countries, their share of the global economy is increasing over time. It's already roughly one third of global GDP, whereas the share represented by the G7, the colonial powers, is declining over time and is already less than 30%. Like you mentioned, like BRICS, how important, how big BRICS is now. But it's just funny, uh, I think you saw that news as well, Financial Times, or which, a uh, Bloomberg? Well, I forgot the mid media. The headline is uh, China and China's Xi Jinping is backing out from the international uh, stage or diplomacy, which to me was hilarious because just be a week, one week before they published the article, BRICS leaders just met in South Africa. Not only BRICS, those five countries, countries from around the world came here. We also have new members. And uh, funny enough, they don't consider those countries, the Global South countries, as the world. Yeah, according to Bloomberg, which will constantly publish these articles and other Western media outlets criticizing China, they acknowledge that more than 40 countries want to join BRICS. So if China is so isolated, why are so many countries asking to join this bloc? You mentioned that six new countries have been formally invited to join, and that's the beginning of expansion. And I mean, furthermore, not only was the BRICS summit held, but also the G77 plus China summit was held in Cuba, which there was very little coverage of in the Western media, but is very important. A lot of that media coverage recently was because President Xi and also President Putin of Russia decided not to attend the G20 summit in India for a variety of reasons. I think, you know, one of the reasons is simply them acknowledging the fact that the G20 has been 
politicized by the Western powers. The United States used the G20 summit to try to force other countries to demonize Russia. They tried to get a statement involved around Ukraine. It didn't work out in the end, but we see a clear attempt to politicize the G20, which is supposed to be a neutral space. I mean, the G20 was itself created by the Western powers. It was US and EU officials who decided who would be invited to join when it was created in the 1990s. And so furthermore, so Xi and Putin decided not to attend, but that doesn't mean that they're isolated. Instead, they prioritized the G77 plus China summit in Cuba. And even that name, a lot of people have never even heard of that. What is the G77? It was created in the 1960s and it represents the non-aligned movement. It was created by the formerly colonized countries that were newly independent, that were freeing themselves from European colonialism. And it was originally the group of 77 countries, but today it's double that. It's 134 countries are represented in the G77, and they represent more than 80% of the world population. I wanna repeat that, more than 80%, that is four fifths of humanity, are represented by the G77 plus China. They met in Cuba, they released a joint statement. China played an important role helping to facilitate that process. So, okay, she didn't attend the G20, which represents a small percentage of humanity compared to the G77, which is 80%. It's objectively false to say that China is isolated. In fact, it's increasingly the West, but the Western media, when they say that China is isolated, what they mean is that the West no longer likes China. That's what they mean, because to them, the entire world revolves around the West. You know, there used to be this idea of like, the, the uh, when you look at like heliocentricity, the idea that, that the, the sun went around the, the earth, right? Like everything revolves around the earth and not the other way, obviously we know the reality. Well, this is basically how the West sees the world. Everything else revolves around the West. If countries don't have good relations with the West, they're isolated, despite the fact that they have good relations with the rest of the humanity. And again, the West only represents around 13% of the world population. So objectively speaking, China is not isolated. In fact, increasingly, it's Western countries that are isolated because it's easy to explain. They're waging wars, they're imposing unilateral sanctions, they're bullying countries, they're lecturing countries. That's why it's become very common to hear diplomats in the Global South say, when a Western politician visits, we get a lecture. When a Chinese diplomat visits, we get a bridge, we get a road, we get a hospital. Yeah. Also, I remember uh, Global South leaders also say when Chinese delegation came, they talk about a cooperation, they talk about the businesses. When American delegation came here, they talk about China. <laughs> That's a completely different op opposite mindset, right? No wonder, I mean, the West don't, see, don't understand why Global South don't like them anymore. Yeah, I mean, so Western politicians will fly to an airport in a Global South country that was built by China. They will go on a road that was built by China. They will go into a big yeah. building that was built by China and then tell that official in Africa or Latin America or another part of Asia, they'll tell them, don't trust China. <laughs> yeah. You mentioned that the West, the West thing, the world revolves around them. I have a funny sticker on WeChat, which is the earth revolves around United States. <laughs> this is a sticker of our exactly. friends trolling themselves. But you, uh, speaking of the unilateral sanctions, we have to look at the recent big news because that probably gonna change the world. Uh, recently, Venezuela's Maduro visited China. He visited not only Beijing, but also Shenzhen where Huawei was based and the serious Assad and his wife and his children also came to China having a wonderful time because everywhere they go the Chinese people will give the warmest welcome to them and I checked the Weibo I still see the comments all of them say you know the the rose from Damascus will bloom again all of them support Syrian people they they think they are tough people that can, you know, bravely uh, fighting with the uh, United States sanctions and uh, they suffered so much. And so they give them the loudest welcome, loudest shout to the athletes who played at Asian Games, the Syrian athletes at Sy uh, Asian Games. I mean, finally, I think some country give them the welcome, the house 
hospitality that a head of a state deserve to get, and also the welcome to the people. I mean, this two incidents will have a huge impact on the global balance of power. How do you see how this will change? Uh, Latin America. How will this change the global south? I agree. These are very important historic developments, and they also come right after another important development involving sanctions, which is China, Huawei specifically, basically proving that Western sanctions, U.S. sanctions, are no longer really having much of an impact because now Huawei is developing new cell phones, such high technology that. Are in many ways better, or at the same level as the top-level cell phones in the West, and is now using advanced semiconductors. I'm talking about the Mate 60 Pro, which has seven nanometer chips that the U.S. tried to prevent China from getting by imposing sanctions. And now, in just a few years, Huawei and other firms in China have proven that the sanctions are no longer going to prevent them from developing. So that happened. Then Maduro came, and. As you pointed out, it's important that Maduro didn't just come to the political capital, Beijing. He spent a lot of time in Shenzhen and other areas looking at technological development, and that's important because a lot of countries in Latin America and other parts of the global south really want to industrialize. They need to develop their own industries, especially in a country like Venezuela, which for a hundred years has been a petro state. It has nothing to do with Hugo Chavez. It was before he was born. It's been a country that's been completely dependent on simply extracting and exporting oil. And that's not in the future. That's not a, a sustainable model. They need to find new ways to diversify their economy. So naturally, he's asking for a, for help from China. And it's not just it's win-win cooperation. It's, it's not just one side that benefits. And Venezuela wants to develop economically, and Syria wants to rebuild. You cannot see a more different response because the United States has quite literally said, U.S. officials have said they don't want Syria to rebuild. They have said that publicly. So,、um, the current head of the Pentagon's Middle East desk, the Pentagon is the Department of Defense in the U.S. The head of the Middle East desk is this essentially war criminal named Dana Struhl, and she headed the Congressional Syria Study Group. In this, this was a comprehensive study they did over the war in Syria, which is still going on. Technically, the fighting has largely ended, but the U.S. through sanctions has been suffocating the Syrian people, and the. Illegal unilateral sanctions that the U.S. and also the European Union have imposed on Syria have resulted in hyperinflation, an economic crisis, a shortage of goods like oil, for instance, because the U.S. is militarily occupying the oil fields in Syria. And you can go online and you can find video footage of U.S. soldiers with U.S. flags and armored vehicles occupying Syria's oil fields. I mean, this is neo-colonialism. They're also occupying the wheat. Fields, the wheat-rich region, so they're starving the Syrian government of revenue it needs to rebuild, and starving it of food and oil. So there are huge oil shortages. There are very long lines to to get gasoline in in Syria. The West has been waging medieval siege warfare against the people of Syria, not just the Syrian government, the people of Syria. We're talking about millions of people suffering. The U.S. government conducted a study group led by this official. Dana Struhl, and then she published a report on it. And in, in an interview, she explained what the U.S. strategy was for Syria. And she said this publicly. She said, "One, our goal is to prevent Syria from rebuilding. We want to use sanctions to prevent Syria from being able to import the materials that it needs, from being able to import the skilled labor it needs, etc., to train people to rebuild." So, quite literally, the U.S. goal is, after helping to destroy Syria, keeping it in rubble. They don't. I mean, imagine how sadistic and, and cynical that is. Furthermore, she said that we own. This is the the head of Pentagon of Middle East policy at the Pentagon. She said we own the oil in Syria. That's the term, the language she used. We own it. We own one third of Syrian territory. Is what she said. So these are essentially neo-colonialists. Compare that to what China said to the Syrian government. We want to help you rebuild. We can do this in a way that is win-win cooperation. You will benefit. We can also benefit. This idea is completely alien to the United States, and it's it's easy to explain why. Because the United States government 
is controlled by large corporations, whereas the Chinese government controls the large corporations. There are big corporations in China, there are rich people, but they don't control the government. They're disciplined by the government. The government acts on behalf of the interest of what's best for the people. In the US, it's the opposite. The government has been completely controlled by rich people, by big capitalists, by huge corporations, by financial interests, by banks. It's not profitable, simply. So if something is not profitable, the government doesn't do it. Whereas the Chinese government is able to engage in win-win cooperation. I love that term. You know, the Chinese government has popularized it, but I think it's a great term, and I've noticed that other governments around the world have started using it. Because that's what diplomacy should be based on. That's what economic development should be based on. Win-win cooperation. Why does everything have to be a zero-sum game where one side wins and the other side loses? The only reason that that's not possible in the United States is because the government is run by all of these large financial interests. And in US elections, elections, more than 90% of candidates for the Congress who have more funding win. That is to say, it's not really a democracy. It's the best democracy that money can buy. It's a plutocracy. It's an oligarchy. If you want to run for Congress, you have to get the support of the big banks, of the insurance companies, of big pharmaceutical corporations, of big banks, of all of these large corporations, of Silicon Valley, of the military industrial complex. That's not a democracy. Your constituents are not the people. They're large corporate interests. So that also explains why the US continues to wage war around the world, because people say, well, why does the U.S. keep doing this? It's so crazy. Well, it's actually profitable for them. And now we see that it's not U.S. lives that are being lost. It's Ukrainian lives that are being lost. It's Syrian lives that are being lost. And who profits? The U.S. military industrial complex. Like you said, win-win cooperation. That should, that's what diplomacy should be, not zero-sum game. I remember like Saudi Arabia and Iran become friends again. Before that, when China was visiting Saudi Arabia and have a good relationship, I think the Western media said, well, that's a... Uh, I mean, a knife in the back to Iran. And then when they have a good relationship with Iran, they said, well, you're betraying Saudi Arabia. They didn't thought, they didn't see the peaceful, how does a friendship can be made between Saudi Arabia and Iran by China. They didn't see that that could happen. What, you can make two arch enemies become friends again? I mean, that's the mindset of the West. It's always you're either with me or against me. It's like my win, your loss. They never thought, hey, we can all be friends as long as we can have a common economical interests. So uh, it's, uh, so I agree with uh, your, your... But it's, it's hard to get rich sharing. If you share, <laughs> it's hard to get rich. Um, well, actually, I wanted, I wanted to take, make a comment about Saudi, Saudi Arabia and Iran. It's not just serious visit. All of this has a... I think it's part of the ripple effects of Saudi Arabia and Iran. Uh, become friends again and this was with the help of China atheist country <laughs> which is very interesting so now you see it has a ripple effect in every part of the world every country who used to be enemies who broke diplomatic ties now become friends again so that definitely will change the future of the world right it's already changing the world that we're in right now I mean the fact that Saudi Arabia and Iran were both invited to join BRICS. That is only possible due to the diplomatic rapprochement that was negotiated by China. Again, this is another symbol of how China's approach is completely the opposite of the U.S. approach. The U.S. for decades has been trying to use Saudi Arabia, I mean, against the interests of Saudi Arabia, treating it as a proxy against Iran. I mean, that, that doesn't benefit Saudi Arabia. It certainly doesn't benefit Iran, obviously. It only benefits the United States. Whereas now, Iran and Saudi Arabia can at least have cordial diplomatic relations. They're certainly not allies, but they're not at war with each other. They can have peace, and you can't have economic development when you're at war with each other, of course. Now, the United States, which is on the other side of the planet, across an ocean, when it, when it fuels these wars, it's never attacked. Its territory is never touched which is why it can profit, it, profit so much from these conflicts, fueling conflicts on the other side of the world, right? But in the case of China's diplomacy, people will say that I'm just echoing Chinese propaganda or whatever. No, but really, it really is as simple. China is encouraging peace in the world and the US is encouraging more war. It's not just with Iran and Saudi Arabia. Look at Ukraine. 
The U.S. constantly says the only solution is a military solution. The European Union says the same thing. Joseph Rell, the head of foreign policy, when he's not claiming that Europe is a great civilized garden <laughs> and the barbaric hordes in the global south are the jungle. jungle, when he's not saying that, he's saying that the only solution to the proxy war in Ukraine is a military solution. Whereas China and also Brazil and some other countries are saying we want to negotiate a peaceful resolution. We want a diplomatic settlement. The U.S. is fueling this conflict with more and more weapons, higher and higher levels of technology to, that are better at killing people. That's not going to bring about peace. So again, if you look at many regions around the world, the U.S. is the one fostering instability, conflict, and even war, and China is encouraging peace. And again, it's simply because China understands that you cannot have economic development with instability and war. If you, if you are guided by capitalist interest, only trying to make profits, if big corporations control you, then okay, you will fuel these conflicts and then you can make a bunch of money profiting from the conflicts like the US does, right? But if you look at it from China's perspective, which can actually have a government that acts in mutually beneficial ways, because it's not controlled simply by large corporations, it's controlled by the Communist Party of China acting in the interest of the people of China, they can say things like, all right, let's sit down and let's talk about how we can both benefit. I mean, that should be how humanity operates. But again, I mean, according to the US, that's communist propaganda because sharing is considered bad basically in the US because it's how, how do I get rich? That's the way they think about it. How can I become a billionaire? That, that's, the, that's the philosophy. And when China promotes peaceful resolution for the Russian-Ukrainian conflict, they say China is supporting Russia's war. <laughs> I mean, there's a peaceful resolution. How, how is that China supporting a war? And who is really supporting a war when you keep sending weapons to a country? I mean, you keep giving your friends who are fighting with a knife? Is that the way to deal with the conflict? Your friend is fighting with a knife and you give him an, an assault rifle. <laughs> and like he's fighting it instead of trying to solve the conflict. It's like, yeah, I just shoot a bunch of people. Yeah. And we are the ones, if we pointed out, for example, NATO's role in the whole incident, and we were being labeled as sneakiest Russian propagandist, as the article on Daily Beast wrote, I said truth. I said real things happen in the world, and somehow you are supporting the war. You are Russian's propagandist. That's how narrow minded the mainstream Western media are now. They cannot accept a different opinion, even though they keep claiming they are the freest democratic institutions in the world, you can say anything. But then, especially if you look at the opinion section on New York Times, it's horrifying to me. What are the headlines? We need to bomb Iraq. <laughs> uh, uh, bomb Iran. No, 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 we need to bomb the DPRK. No, we need to bomb Syria. Yeah. No, 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 we need to bomb all of them at the same time. That's what the debate is. It's which country should we attack, and the debate is about which country and how we should do it. Some people say, no, 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 that's the wrong country. Instead of, instead of attacking Russia, we should attack China. No, no, instead of attacking China, we should attack Iran. And then some people say, well, I agree we should attack Iran, but instead we should attack it in this way. And they're like, no, no, we should attack it in this way. That's, that's the limit, that, that's the great, uh, you know, the spectrum of voices that are allowed in the US media. No anti-war voices, it's what war should we wage and why and how. And only Russia's war can be criticized. <laughs> Thomas Friedman, who is a New York Times columnist, has supported every single US war, the war in Iraq, the war in Libya, etc. And he just wrote an article, and the headline is something like, how can a superpower deal with a state run by a war criminal? And had a photo of Putin. And it's just like, <laughs> wait a second, how can a superpower deal with a state run by a war criminal? You have supported every single war in the United States. This, you're, you're describing your own country, but they're so oblivious. And again, this shows that they really do think that the world revolves around them. That's why when they see countries like China or other countries or Russia, they say that they're isolated. But then you look at UN votes and you see that the countries representing the majority of the global population are neutral or they even support them. Or you look at their trade agreements. And what actually is happening is that the West is losing its hegemony. And for them, that means the end of the world because they see the entire world is rolling around them. So 
if you're not friendly with the West, you're isolated, even if you have good relations with countries that represent the majority of humanity. Wow, very interesting conversation with you, all, as always. But uh, since you're in China, I'm wondering, what's your goal in China? What are you looking for? What would you want to get from the experience in China? Well, I want to meet a lot, of, a lot more Chinese people to understand how they think about these conflicts that are happening in the world and the role that China can play. I think there's, what's interesting is there also is kind of a political evolution happening. And a lot of people in China increasingly are, you know, they're also seeing all these things that are happening and becoming more and more politically involved and anti-imperialist and, and interested in helping to build this new international movement against imperialism and neocolonialism. I mean, we can see that very clearly. In Latin America, that is definitely happening as well. And, you know, there was this period in the 1990s and 2000s, we were told it was the end of history. U.S. neoliberal philosophers like Francis Fukuyama said that Western-style liberal capitalist democracy was the final mode of human development, that there would be no other models. And a lot of people internalized that. Even in Global South countries, there were a lot of people who thought that Basically, they just needed to emulate the West. And now, more and more people are saying that no, that is not the future. A lot of these Western countries are in decline. Not only are multiple European economies entering recession, but we see mass deindustrialization. We see political instability and the rise of far right and even fascistic movements across the West. And you could say that in many ways, many Western countries are going back to the dark ages. I mean, it's really scary, honestly, seeing what's happening and then you start thinking that maybe you know the 1930s in Europe was not you know some crazy random you know incident that would never be repeated i mean what europe fascism in europe was exactly what europe did to the rest of the world european colonialism was fascism for the people in the colonies and now we see that the western capitalist economies cannot they cannot grow without exploitation of the global south. Their economic models were fundamentally based on imperialism. And now that global south countries have finally been able to exercise sovereignty and have finally been able to develop slowly, I mean, they're still in the process of developing, it's a long process, and Western economies are in decline, you have the rise of these fascistic movements saying, the solution is bring back blatant colonialism. We have to recolonize the global south because that's the only way we can get rich. Seeing that happening, it's so blatant, the blatant racism, the US president saying that, you know, Mexicans are, I won't even say what it is because it'll be, this video will be censored or whatever. But you know, like, I mean, just the dehumanization. Donald Trump referred to the vast majority of countries as s-hole countries, saying that they're just garbage, they're not worth it. I mean, that's the way a lot of, I mean, that's of course the impolite way of saying it, but then you look at Joseph Perel, who's a great, Brell's a great, you know, enlightened Western liberal, and he says jungle and garden. So he's not as blatantly racist, but it's still obviously racist. I mean, maybe he sounds more polite than Donald Trump, but a huge part of the ruling class in these Western countries believes that. And a lot of people, average people don't believe that necessarily, but their governments are completely undemocratic. And I think there is the possibility of political change in these countries, but the problem is that the political system is so undemocratic and it's so controlled by large corporate interests, by oligarchs, by billionaires, that there isn't actually the space for the kind of transformative change. And what we're actually seeing is that the billionaires, the big corporations, would rather go back to fascism than have transformative change. So, I mean, the old socialists in the 20th century, like Rosa Luxemburg, they used to talk about, they, were, they used to say that there are two paths, socialism or barbarism. And what we're seeing really is the return to barbarism. And China is showing that there is a new path, a path of socialist development. It's a different path for different countries. It's not trying to impose the same model in every country. And what I want to learn also, and that's why I want to do a PhD here in focusing on economics in particular, is I want to learn in particular what different Chinese economists, political economists, politicians see as the path for development. Because Clearly, China is also going through a kind of transition moment, right? Where China was able to build up industrial production in an incredible way. I mean, China now represents more than 31% of global manufacturing production. It's the factory of the world, whereas the United States has declined 
And now the United States represents around 14% of global manufacturing production that is decreasing because the US economy in the neoliberal era has become financialized. It's not about actually producing tangible products that we need, right? China is making huge strides, not only with electronics like cell phones we were talking about, but also with electric vehicles. It's incredible to see that there are already so many electric vehicles on the streets here in Beijing. In the US, there are almost none. And China is now the world's largest car manufacturer. In just three years, China has gone from producing very few cars to overtaking all of the big car manufacturers, not only the US, but also Germany and Japan, the world's leading car manufacturers. China is leading the way with electric vehicles. China is leading the way with renewable energy, whether that's uh, solar panels, wind turbines. In fact, China alone represents more than 80% of all of the world's investment in renewable energy technology. So that's why, again, so many people are interested in trying to learn from the Chinese economic model. It has led to results. Now, obviously, socialism with Chinese characteristics is Chinese. It's very unique for China's circumstances. But there are a lot of things that people can learn, especially in developing countries. And that's why so many people are saying the Western neoliberal economic model is clearly, it's, it's in the death stage. I mean, it's in decline. The Chinese model of socialism with Chinese characteristics has resulted in this massive development. The Vietnamese model as well of its own unique form of socialism is resulting in massive growth. So what are they doing? How can we learn from it and how can we adapt it for our own countries? The West is losing their mind. So <laughs> they are so insecure. I think that's a lot, a lot, a lot of the actions now they're doing is because of this feel so, so insecure. And you mentioned how China China's rise is not based on exploitation or colonization. For example, serious visits to China these days. Most of the comments you see on China's social networks from Chinese netizens, they say because we used to be under the ring, so now we want to give umbrellas to others. So they, they deeply understand what Syrian people went through when you, I mean, all the foreign powers come to your country, loot your resources, destroy your country. So they want to support who also suffering from this. Look at the China's history. China never invaded or colonized other countries. I talked to so many African opinion, like scholars, experts. They all said, you know, Chinese, the earliest Chinese um, sailors came to Africa, but he came to, landed on Africa, talked to locals, got back on the boat, come, <laughs> went back to China. It was only when Europeans came, everything became so, I don't know, destroyed. And when Joseph Borrell said, Europe is a garden, how did you de develop your garden? You, because you took everything from the jungle and you developed, you, you, you stole the resources, the gold, the human to your garden, build your garden. Now you can have a garden and you think the rest is jungle, but you're still stealing gold, oil, all these minerals from the jungle. Um, I think I, I shared with you the other day about how I feel so confident about the young generations in China. When we were kids, because our teachers or our parents, the older generations, lived through a very poor period of China, when they would feel so not confident and insecure when facing the very developed West. So a lot of the people from the older generation they are not confident about Chinese culture, their country. The young generations come, have a completely opposite mindset. A few examples that I mentioned the other day, elect a teacher who went to a middle school to teach all the kids. And during this the lecture, what he said was ridiculous. He was teaching all the kids, you need to study hard because you can earn more money. All your studying is about earning more money. Only when you have more money, you can have more power and uh, go to another country, marry a white person, and that's what your goal should be. But then a teenager from the crowd could not bear hearing one more word from this professor. He stood up, walked on the stage, grabbed the microphone from the professor, and shout to the crowd, don't listen to this professor who is full of crap. What, why we are studying? We are studying for the rejuvenation of Chinese nation from a teenager. And that's one, and I also talk to many people, uh, other foreign people or Chinese people who, uh, who interacted with the students. They are also in, so impressed. My friend who is uh, Iraqi, who recently visited China, 
he met a group of Chinese students in universities who are fluent in Arabic. And not only are those students fluent in Arabic, one of the students said, "Well, I'm also learning Swahili because I want to go to Africa." I mean, that's the young generation, and there are so many young Chinese are so multilingual. Not only they speak English, they're speaking multiple languages. They want to go to the world, so they are confident about their own culture. They are also interested in the rest of the world and all the politics. And also, what happened is, I, like, just to share with you, just Huawei shows perfectly how resilient and how confident Chinese companies are now.、Um, Huawei not only released their new phones. And they recently also have this press conferences, released tons of other products. The day they chose the press conference, the day Meng Wanzhou returned to China, they are so resilient. And everything America did to China is backfiring because all the you only develop all those Chinese companies, and they don't need you anymore. They will be the game changer. And it makes you wonder which country really is the garden and which is the jungle. <laughs> I mean, China is also. It is so safe. It is amazing how safe it is. In the U.S., there are, there are every day on average there are there's a mass shooting. In fact, I think there are two or three every day on average. Every year there's something like every day. a thousand every year. There are also more than one thousand people killed by police every year. There's a there's at least one police shooting on average every single day. I mean that's unthinkable. I mean China is so safe. So again, which is the garden and which is the jungle? But what you were also saying, in particular about the century of humiliation, right? Which is a century of colonialism or partial colonialism. It made me think of a place that I visited here in Beijing, which is Yuanmingyuan, which is the the garden of the Summer Palace, which was invaded by the supposed gardeners of Europe. The UK and France invaded China in 1860. They invaded the actual garden of Yuanmingyuan, and then they burnt down the palace. What kind of behavior? That's that's like. The behavior of the jungle, as they put it, like in their racist terminology, that is colonialism. That is barbaric violence. It also reminds me of the 1900 invasion of the Eight Nation Alliance. In particular, I've been thinking a lot about this because there was this recent scandal that I'm sure you saw, where the U.S. was training military exercises for a potential war against mainland China over Taiwan, supporting separatists. And in the background of this photo that the U.S. military published, there was an image of the Eight Nation Alliance invasion and occupation of Beijing in 1900. The United States was part of that Eight Nation Alliance. It was the supposed Garden Nations, the colonial powers, the European powers, Japan and the U.S. that invaded China and occupied the capital. That was in 1900. That was not that long ago. So. Which which country still acts like the jungle, the country that invades nations all around the world? The U.S. has been at war for my entire life. The U.S. has been at war for the entire lives of my parents, of my grandparents. This is a country that is constantly at war. That is the actual behavior of the jungle. I mean, I even obviously I hate this whole racist jungle garden thing. I mean, we should get rid of that terminology. But if you want to use that terminology, the U.S. is much more jungle-like. Just the fact that, as you mentioned, that. China has been able to develop in this way without imperialism, without colonialism, is a testament to that fact. And again, it's also a testament to one of the victories of the Chinese Revolution, and how the capitalist countries in the West they developed not simply through the free market and hard work; it was through colonialism. And China has shown that countries can develop by not engaging in imperialism. Through a unique socialist model, which is again why so many countries in the global south are trying to learn from China. They're not trying to learn from the West because they don't want to just invade the rest of the world, pillage the rest of the world, and take their natural resources, which is what the Western powers did. But when people like us, like me,、uh, like the young generations who are proud of our culture, proud of our country, and defend our country in facing, I don't know, all those lies from Western media and politicians. We're being labeled as ultra nationalistic, aggressive. <laughs> I got these labels. I got those labels from different media and some people. You're you're just、uh, ultra nationalistic, aggressive. All those words being put up. You, you know what's ultra nationalistic?、Mm -hmm. U.S. politicians saying repeatedly, not just Trump, not just Republicans, Democrats. We are the greatest nation in the history of humanity. <laughs> what? It's common, not just Donald Trump, not just you know the the racist Republicans who say that we need to build a wall, build a wall, USA. Republicans, 
I mean, sorry, Democrats as well, who claim to be enlightened and anti-racist, it's common for them to say, Obama said, we are the greatest nation in history. We are the greatest country on earth. You cannot be more ultra-nationalist than that. If you truly believe that, that is ultra, ultra, hyper, uber-nationalism. We are the greatest nation in human history. Yet, America only exists for 200 years. <laughs> yeah. And for most of that history, slavery was legal, women didn't have equal rights, black people didn't have equal rights. So they say the greatest country in history. Well, until the 1960s, a lot of people in the U.S. didn't even have civil rights. And they think China, who existed in the world for 5,000 years, returning to the global stage as something bizarre and they cannot accept. How hilarious is that? So thank you so much, Ben. I think we have a very long but a very interesting conversation. I'm sure our viewers will love this episode and they will love to see you in Beijing. I mean, once this episode is published, I'm sure a lot of people, it will blow, blow a lot of minds. Thank you so that. much, Ben. And um, this show always welcome you to come back to share your views. And even though actually your show is much more popular than mine, I'm no, a little bit no. jealous, but you deserve it because you did a really good job. Um, really good speaker and very insightful as well. So I hope you do enjoy your journey in Beijing, in China. Maybe you would choose to spend the rest of your life in China. <laughs>